Um, <clears throat> let's go to um, Revelation chapter 7. And I, I've been sharing the last, not last class, but the one before it, uh, where I got <clears throat> wound up and just wanted to share the whole book. So I shared some from here. <clears throat> but... Uh, Let's read a little bit here. Uh, Revelation 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. <clears throat> okay, so we should ask the question, why? And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay, now skip down to verse nine. And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Okay, so uh, I guess I should have read verse four first. Okay, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they, they, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand and all the tribes of the children of Israel. <clears throat> now verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their uh, hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, uh, who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. <clears throat> all right. So, um, first of all, let me correct something that I knew better, and I don't know why I said it in the last one, <clears throat> but it proves I am no scholar in the book of Revelation. And, um, you know, even as I search, uh, I'm continually confronted with stuff I don't know. You know, I can only... I can only get what I do know. <clears throat> but I, I did know this, and I don't know why I shared it as such, so I'll just read what I wrote. The seal found in Revelation 2-7 is not the seventh seal. It is the seal of the living God, and, and uh, it is totally separate from the seven seals that are, you know, basically destructive, although not completely, because the true seventh seal is found in Revelation 8, 1, I think it is, and its silence was upon, you know, for a, a period of time, which is probably a good idea. <laughs> Start now, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I said, silence is a good idea, and she goes, oh yeah, did you hear? Anyway, um, <clears throat> So the seventh seal is that silence. This seal is not one of the seven, and it is the seal of the living God. And we did talk about that uh, quite a bit in the last class. Um, <clears throat> and then I think I've mentioned this, but I can't remember. There are breaks throughout the book of Revelation that show the power and strength that moves God's story along. There are things that move God's story along in the book of Revelation, just like there are things that move things along in new creation. Um, you know, Abraham marked his life by altars. And you can see it, it's clear. It is clear cut. Just read his life, altar. Next big change, altar. Next big change, altar. It's, it's marked by altars. And I can tell you without, without being compared at all to Abraham or anybody spiritual <clears throat> just the fact that I know for sure my life has been marked by altars and there is no question about it and for those who have eyes to see you can literally see what has moved new creation fellowship along and I'm not the only one but I'm just saying as as one <clears throat> there have been altars and these altars when they would come up uh, if handle if the altar is handled properly it's it it life springs forth as a result and it and it gives a shot in the arm and I mean I know this is dumb to say but at least from my uh, um, looking and trying to note things it seems like about seven years 
Now, I would assume that really depends more on the, the amount of death, but I've just noticed for a lot of the, the moving along that has happened, it's about seven years, and then it, it got, time comes again where there's, it's time to go through another big death. <clears throat> so, um, so there are breaks. There are breaks throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, and those breaks usually end up showing things before the throne. In other words, earth, 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 usually bad stuff, bad stuff. But, but then just before the break, someone or some group of people die in the, in the Lord, in the Lamb. And then you see this, that's where the breaks are coming from. They're coming from death that happened in the earth by the Lamb. And then you see this reaction or you... you you hear this, you know, this great stuff around the throne of the Lamb. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, they are chapters that emphasize the death of the Lamb in us along with its glorious results above. For example, chapter 7, verse 9, and then verse 13 through 17 evol involve those who have gone through death. And this is what brings glory to the Lamb as they stand before his throne and not merely random worship. So... <clears throat> we see, we tend to read the book of Revelation and we go, oh look, chapter 5, oh look, they're worshiping the Lamb. And then we go into chapter 7, uh, verse whatever, 13, about there. And we go, oh look, they're worshiping the Lamb. This is about worship. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I mean, that's, a, that's what we do. We do that. We read, we, you know, we may not even say it's about worship. We'll just note that they're worshiping the Lamb, not realizing that they're worshiping the source from which all these people gave themselves. And that's why it says salvation unto our God, not salvation to us. Glory, where is that? Verse uh, uh, 10. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So let's see. I, do, I wrote something here on that. <clears throat> We'll get to it in a minute, and I'll explain that a little bit more. <clears throat> um, so in verse 1, we see the process. In order to get the lamb branded into our minds, verse 3 and 4, there's a temporary withholding of the trials to get it in us, you know. And I've seen that. I've seen that in counseling. I've seen that where I have had people have been going, maybe the enemy is just attacking them, and they're just overwhelmed. Uh, or maybe was, or just something else, overwhelmed with a situation. And I will pray and I will ask the Spirit of God to lift up a standard against them, <coughs> against the enemy and, and those things, and to put a hedge of protection around them until they get time with the Lord where they can get strong enough to get over this stuff. Well, that's a little sissy version of, of what this is about. God holding back things until we can get sealed with this. Sealed with this. Um, you know, so what is the seal of the Holy Spirit? Christ crucified. Anyway. Um, um, so what is in your head will eventually affect your hands. So he's trying to get it sealed in the mind, not just the brain. The followers of the Lamb and the followers of the beast are marked in the same location but with different marks. When referring to the beast, it is called a mark, but when referring to the saints, it's called a seal. I like that. <clears throat> and it is. It's pretty cool. Uh, the mark or seal shows of what sort you are of, of what sort you are. Um, I mean... I'm going to say this, and <clears throat> you know, who knows if I'm right or wrong. But I think that those things are being proved out now. I think that we're in a process now uh, of going through trials and of situations, and th either the beast is marking us with his his mark that says, uh, you know, okay, I'll give in to my. You know, we don't know. We wouldn't say I'm giving in to the beast. You know, we'd never say that. We'll just give in to, you know, 
uh, if this is unfair, this is that, I'm going to react this way, I'm going to think this way, I'm going to do this. And it's a beastly way. It's the way of the beast. It is, you know, not, you know, it doesn't have to be the beast, the Antichrist. It's that beast spirit. Remember, you know, lambs and beasts? Anybody remember this? This is what we're talking about. And it is that thing, that <clears throat> deal where he is... Um, where the Lord, but see, the enemy is just as active. Um, so where the Lord of the beast, the Lord is trying to seal our minds with this reality of Christ crucified. And the beast is trying to prove to us, you know, that, you know, well, you know, if I don't do this, then I'm not going to be able to buy and sell. And we're not talking, you know, we're talking about, yes. Uh, the Lord is just, there's been just a real intensive time with the Lord and seeking Him and reactions and this all that's going on and, and without you know going into a lot of detail, the way that the Spirit was moving on me and drew out my heart, I just told the Lord, I said, okay, if this I begin to get a grasp of, oh, this is what oneness is, this is what you know weakness that the lamb feels is like just like a little glimpse of it. And I told the Lord, okay, let's I want to let you push every single button in me, like every single one. Right. The, and every single trigger, and let's go through this together where I can learn this. In every possible situation, I always react. And I told him that. Right. I told the Lord that. And yeah. it's just really true what you're sharing about yeah. how the Lord is trying to seal our minds. And I feel like, you know, that was something the Lord kind of brought me to. I mean, I'm the one who asked for it, but I felt the Lord brought to the point where I could ask for that when I began to realize, oh my gosh, I really do want this mind. I really don't have it. But I, let's go. We can do this together. Let's That's go. Right. You, know, you know, I don't know. Just, it was just a real precious thing in the Lord. I'm really excited about it. So. Yeah. Well, you should be. You should be excited about it. Because um, <clears throat> if these are the real issues, and, and it's, I'm going to even say it like this, you know, if these are the real issues of life and not the end time, but right now, because, see, nobody's lived through the end time yet. Does that seem weird? You know, well, it's only reserved for a few people, and it's going to be, you know what I mean? It's like, <clears throat> no. If these are the issues, then what Mallory just said is addressing those issues on a lamb-beast level. Because, remember, the book of Revelation takes it all down to that. You know, there, it's not like, okay, here's the followers of the Lamb, and here's the beast and the followers of the beast, and then there's this group over here that are the United Methodists. <laughs> you know, it's not that. I don't know. I just, <laughs> but there's not. There's not that. There is no other group. This is it. When it's all shaken down, you know, and you see that. You see, you see that. You see that in the beginning, God. Okay, in the beginning, God. So there's God, and then all things are created by him. And so this vast creation and everything else, you know, is comes out. It's like, so here's God, and whoosh, universe, and all this stuff. And bam, it just flies up, and it's just vast. But when it's all done, the king, Jesus has the kingdom, and he delivers it all back up to God. And it's just all this nature, God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, selfless giving, and then us incorporated into his spirit. We, we get all caught up in all the stuff, see? And the only thing eternal is God. <clears throat> and that's why we become partakers of the divine nature. But we're not divine. It's his nature. We're just made his body. And um, anyway... Uh, so th the point of all that is that <clears throat> that when it's when it's after it's all released, when it's all shaken down, it's down to these things right here. This is it. This is it. And only God knows everybody's motives. I don't even think we always know all of our motives, but <clears throat> but I will tell you that years ago. God started dealing with me about this issue of motives. And when I say years ago, I mean a lot of years ago. And, and started telling me, everything comes down to, to your motive. 
You know, it's, you know, we get all freaked out about what we do, and he says, well, your motive was this a long time before you did it, or this or that. You know, our motive is usually for self. Or that's true, okay? And that's a beast. Okay. <clears throat> but his motives, they are, you know, they are like that crystal river, you know? They're just clean because it's really not about him when it should be all about him. But to him, it's about others. But to us, it shouldn't be about us. It should be about him. You see, you see how that works? <clears throat> so we're divided out already <laughs> on a very real way. We're divided out. And the only way, and, and so all come by way of being beasts. There's nobody that wasn't a beast first. <clears throat> right? But we all come by way of the cross, too. The beast must go there, and there must be a death, and that death must be more than a theological truth in Romans 6 or Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> it needs to be the thing that transforms us. There isn't, I mean, did you know that there really is no transformation apart from this, from beast to follower of the Lamb? There, there's no other trans, you know, there's not. You know, that you look into his face and you're changed, and the word change is transformed or metamorphosed into that same image, see? You, you, you can only be a follower of the Lamb by being one with him. You, I mean, ultimately, you can only be that because he's the vine and you're the branch, and you're not going to be, you, you can't be that apart from him. Plug in, baby. That's what it's about. And get, get in there, you know. And <clears throat> Anyway, and so there you also see the body because, you're, you know, here's a branch, and he plugs in, and he da 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 and then a little guy <clears throat> plugs in here, you know, because... Trees have big branches and then little branches and then little twigs coming off of them and then, you know, and you see the body. But it's, it's, you know, plugging into Jesus. For example, when I was in Bible school, <clears throat> there was a man that, <clears throat> to me, at the time, there was nobody that knew the Lord more. And I just said, you know what, I'm <laughs> I'm just a little tiny twig. I didn't know hardly anything. I said, I'm going to plug into the, I'm going to go plug into a big one. <laughs> you know, I didn't go find me a little, you know, I'm going to plug into a big, you know, <laughs> you know, but the point <clears throat> being is, you know, well, you want the Lord, you know what I mean? You want the Lord at whatever cost. And usually that plugging in, there's always a cost because you're grafted out of into or you're broken out of, cut out of into. Anyway, I'm barely getting anything said here. Um, <clears throat> what is in your head will eventually affect your hands. The followers of the lamb and the followers of the beast are marked uh, in the same location, but with different marks, which I call seals and <coughs> crofts. Seals and marks. The mark or seal shows of what sort you are. That seal is eventually found to be the name of the lamb and of his father. Oh my God, and that's uh, Revelation 14, also in verse, or chapter 22. <coughs> that seal is found to be the name of the lamb. You're named by the Lamb. You're not named by your given name that your parents gave you. You're named by the name your father gave you. The Lamb and of the, your father. <clears throat> Which was big stuff to me. I, I'll, I'll jump for that, you know. That sounds good to me. <laughs> for all kind of reasons. Uh, it just makes me want to pursue him and to know him and to be to be conformed and then in that receiving of that seal now you haven't died yet but you're getting you're getting it in your first seal in your mind and then in your hands and all this <clears throat> but
but you begin to be named by him as not just given a name by him, but, you know, because I don't know, what is it, John 10, he says, and he knows us and calls us by name, you know, hey, Randy, yo, get over here. No, stop, you know. I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want to be called by my name. I don't. I want, you know, and it says, you know, in the book of Revelation, he gave him a new name, right? You know? And, and in that name, I mean, if he called me Charles, if in that name, in his heart, there was reality and life and truth and not just slap a name on you when you're a baby and put it on your thing, that's what you are. You know, didn't you ever wonder how, you know, people's names were always being changed? I mean, Paul was Saul of Tarsus, and Abra Abraham was, was Abram, and, you know, on and on and on. They, they would change their names, but they would mean something, you know. Um, Jacob, my God, Israel, prince with God, you know. So, you know, nobody, and I'll give you a name nobody else knows but him. <laughs> Isn't that precious that he knows you? He, he knows you, you know, and you're known by that name, Lamb. Lamb. And of your father. <clears throat> It points out the fact that it is his father so that we might know that the lamb slash son is, the same, is of the same kind as his father, even as we are by him. We become of the same kind, see, of, his, of the lamb and of his father. We're of, he's out of this, and we're out of the lamb that's out of the father. <clears throat> Again, in Revelation 9, 4, we see a similarity with the book of Exodus, which you see it all the way through. The seal was upon the, the followers of the Lamb to keep them from the judgments of the locusts. The blood, which is a slaughtered lamb seal in, in Exodus, put on the doorpost. The blood, which is a slaughtered lamb seal, was put on the doorpost to protect those who are associated with the lamb. But blood on the doorpost, just as lamb received into the mind, is only the beginning. You know, it's not just about putting blood on the doorpost, for God's sake. That's good. That'll, that'll get you out the door, <laughs> heading in the right direction. <clears throat> but it's going to take more than that when you get to the Red Sea. Um, so... In both cases, the lamb must eventually be eaten and assimilated into our being. It's huge. Blood on the doorpost or sealed with blood is not enough. In both cases, the lamb must eventually be eaten and assimilated into our being. Oh, God. <laughs> Amen. To bring that about will require that the followers of the Lamb realize that the protection provided is momentary. These angels are holding back the destruction. It's momentary with purpose. With purpose. It's momentary during the time they are getting the Lamb sealed in their heads. <laughs> and really in your hearts, but you know. <clears throat> but it does not mean that they will be protected from all trials and troubles once you get the lamb sealed. See, and, and that used to scare me when I was young and the Spirit of God would talk to me like that. And I go, oh, I'm not ready. <laughs> I, mean, I did. You know, I, and I would get a little scared. I'd go, what's around the corner? Is it, is it a feast? <laughs> I'm just a little lamb. Would you do this to me? And he's going, yeah, but you need to get something in your head, boy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's right. 
You need a seal. I'm going to slap my seal on your head. <clears throat> anyway, um, that's not Jewish or Texan. That's Oak Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> But it does not mean they will be protected from all trials and troubles. On the contrary, those will be necessary, those trials and troubles, if the Lamb is ever going to be moved past their minds into becoming nature in them. Oh, man. Oh, thank you, Lord. In Revelation 7, 4, we hear of a number. Should I read it? And I heard the number of them which were sealed. I heard. Yeah, okay. But notice verse 9, and I beheld a great multitude. Okay. <clears throat> In Revelation 7, 4, we hear of a number associated with the followers of the Lamb. It is 144,000. We only hear at this stage because they are, are yet on earth and have not yet passed through death. You know, somebody, people can call you whatever they want to, you know, deep and spiritual and everything, and oh, you've got the, the teaching of the Lamb and all this stuff, but they're only hearing, it's not, they're not going to get anything until you've passed through, and that's who these, in verse 9, they've passed through death. Then they'll see the Lamb. Okay? <clears throat> Um, so you know the number was 144,000, and uh, let's see. Each death we pass through reduces the amount of us, not numbers, but us, but numbers. That's why it's using numbers. It reduces the number of us and increases the amount of him, him in us. Eventually, all numbers related to God's people, eventually, will be reduced down to one, Lamb's wife. That's where it's heading. See? And then you don't see a great multitude, you see lamb's wife. <clears throat> so each death we pass through reduces the amount of us. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> Part of the process requires partaking of the mind of Christ, Philippians 2.5. Suddenly the scene changes. John's attention is turned away from the 144,000 unto a larger number. He was asked, who is this great multitude? Along with, where did they come from? Where are they from? Big questions in heaven, in, around the throne of the Lamb. These are big questions. Do you know who these guys are? Do you know where they came from? <clears throat> Apparently, John did not know. Who are they? They are lambs of the slaughtered lamb, a gathering of martyrs. They are lambs of the slaughtered lamb. They're not merely Christians who had been given white robes, as some might suspect. They're not. They're not merely Christians. They're not standing there because they're merely Christians. They're not reacting to the Lamb as mere Christians. This is not, this is not Revelation 5. We have moved to Revelation 7. There's a progression. There's a difference of how they're relating to the Lamb after having been slain. Okay? <clears throat> um... They were not merely Christians who had been given white robes. Where did they come from? They had come through great tribulation, that which is meant to purify. But by what means had they come out? These white robes had been stained, what the scripture refers to as washed, stained in the blood of the lamb, in the, in the lamb's blood. Stained, in other words, these white robes were red. But white or pure or, or washed. <clears throat> I mean, you know, if you said they've been washed in water, 
they, if you said the robes were once red with the blood of Jesus, but they took them over to a bucket and they washed out the, the red, but it doesn't say that. It says they were washed in the blood. You see the difference? One is, you know, trying to get the blood out. Not a good idea before the throne. I'm just thinking. It's just a thought. You don't want to wash the blood away and go, hey, look at me. I'm white. I got a white robe. <laughs> and he goes, where's the... Yeah, well, he's saying, where's the wedding garment? You know? <clears throat> Um, this was not just blood taken from a slain lamb and put on doorposts. This was not salvation blood. This is important to see that Revelation 7 is not salvation blood. The lamb had bled and was slain in them, and they were covered with his self-givingness. Jesus did not do the washing. They washed. They washed their own robes in the death of Christ. This they did that they might have a proper wedding garment. They were wearing his death as something noble and honorable. It speaks of participation with him in death, yet they live. I love this. I love that I got 15 more minutes to just keep messing with y'all. <laughs> what is their new relationship to the Lamb? They stand before the throne of the Lamb. They, their honor toward the Lamb has to do with salvation, not to us, not our salvation, but to Him that came through His own trials of self giving at the cross. That death along with the pattern of it given to all future lambs, is extolled by those, these who have come by the same means. And to the lamb who sits where upon that throne, glory and honor and salvation. They're exalting his salvation through death unto the throne. It it's not talking about their salvation. You, didn't you ever wonder about that? And cried with a loud voice, salvation to our God and, and who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. This one death on the cross has released a blood flow that will cover all of us and that will also, uh, which is a death that will, will identify us. And that we're washed in this. We're soaked in his death. And having passed through that, their exaltation is not just like Revelation 5. It's not just worthy is the lamb over there. Worthy, oh yes, thank you for dying. Oh, thank you for you know all that you've given us and thank you that we can stand up here in heaven and say thank you because we're standing up here in heaven. <laughs> but rather, Re Revelation 7, we passed through this by the same spirit, by the same death, by the same, we, we're, we're not just believers, we're partakers. Yes? When the feasts and offerings passed, you call the blood sacred lamb life. Yes. And it was just a fresh way of looking mm -hmm. at the blood. I loved sacred lamb life. Kelly said in one of my classes, I, I called the blood the sacred lamb life because the life is in the blood. <clears throat> and the blood was sacred, right? <clears throat> but we go, oh, yeah, blood. Blood's sacred. Oh, I cut my finger. <gasps> oh, that's holy right there. You know, in fact, I smashed my finger underneath my nail right here is dried blood. And this is holy because it's blood. No, no. Sacred lamb life blood. Where am I? 
In the case of the great multitude, we're granted to see the number of the slaughtered, whereas with the 144,000, we only hear the number. Again, that is a proper designation for them. It is the number of the slaughtered. <clears throat> in one of my classes, I think it was the last one in Revelation, maybe I already mentioned this, but I went into detail showing scriptures that this, these ones who came through the great tribulation, it showed there are scriptures that absolutely vouches for nobody made it through except by death. You didn't get out of this. You were slain. Okay, because you would not receive his image. <clears throat> All right, so it's a proper designation, the number of the slaughtered. Uh, and it says, And I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations. <clears throat> Again, that is, uh, let's see, when John does see them, he actually discovers that the number was a great multitude that no man could count. This last number is actually the fulfillment of a specific number in the scriptures. Actually, fulfillment of a number. I looked and behold, great multitude, a number of all nations, <coughs> kindreds, and people. This last number is actually the fulfillment of a specific number. It is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 13, 16, 15, 5, 32, 12. God had promised that through his altered son or out from the son of the altar that the fruit of his death would come an innumerable multitude that keeps going and going and going. And going. <clears throat> specific number to God, see. See that? And it's a fulfillment. See, isn't that weird? We just go, I wonder why, I wonder why this number, and I wonder this and that, and well, with God, it's fulfilling everything about Christ. And y'all remember I called Isaac the altered son. That was, and that's a big deal to me. I use that name. When I say altered, I don't mean he was altered, but he was, but he went to the altar, the son that went to the altar, and, and God had been promising and promising and promising, and even when the son came forth, it wasn't fulfilled, James says, until he took him to the altar, and then from that point on, Abraham had to relate to his son as the altered son, the son of the altar. It was no longer the promised seed, the, the special boy. <laughs> it was the altered son, the son that was at, at the altar. And now when he got up from there, he would, the father was supposed to know him in that way. How much more us if we go there by his same spirit? <clears throat> um Okay, in Revelation uh, 13, 17, <clears throat> Revelation 7, 13, yes, okay. Um, it says, um, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, who are these who are arrayed in white robes, and from where did they come? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they who came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the made them white in the blood of the lamb isn't that cool i mean what <laughs> i just love that therefore are they before the throne that's why they're before the throne they've been soaked in his death and therefore they are before the throne of god and serve him day and night in his temple in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall, and so here it is, they shall hunger no more. Okay, so <clears throat> I want you to see a little, let's see, maybe I should read this first. Okay, how did they come out of the great tribulation? By death, not rapture. <laughs> you see why? If I live to be much older, I will be killed one day. You see why? Because I'm a troublemaker. I'm an evil, evil troublemaker. <laughs> These verses are concerning those who came to honor the Lamb out of their own death and not merely in words of worship. 
They're honoring him out of their own death, not just words of worship. They have lived, um, I wrote this, they have lived the Beatitudes and not just tried to obey them. They hungered and now they'll be comforted. And I, I've tried to fulfill all of them right by putting that so that you could see uh, that. And here's why I put it in there. The Beatitudes and other teachings are the things they went through because of bearing about his dying. They were merciful and they were, they hungered and they did without and they were persecuted and all these things and you do all of that in the course of letting him live in you and put others first and not yourself. This is so big, I just can't tell you. It sounds so cheesy even bringing in the Beatitudes but I'm telling you that it is, the, it is, it is the thing armor, the things that they carry with them and, 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 and do it without awareness of beatitudes, only aware of the lamb nature at work in you. And then you look back and you go, why is he comforting me? Because you mourned for others and you, anyway. Just being in the world by its very nature, a person will go through troubles. But we bear lamb sufferings and not merely earthly trials. We have these because we follow the lamb. That's why, see, I mean, you can just live in the world and then you'll just suffer with worldly junk. It'll, it's got enough that it'll do it. I would rather go through stuff for the kingdom than just because I'm an idiot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I would rather be with the Lord in it, you know? Randy, you don't have to go through that. You know, if you would just, you know, yeah, well, if you, I would just come down from the cross, I wouldn't have to suffer that. Or you. But I'm not coming down. And I, I will be with those sufferings because they're his, and he put his seed and life in me so that I could give it back to him. That's why he did it. And how precious is that? You, you're going to get it, Lord. That's all I got to say. Uh, while going through the trials, they washed their robes in blood and have now come out. <laughs> they go, yeah. But it's not their own blood. It's the blood of the Lamb. It's not their own wounds. It's not their own wounds. <clears throat> All right, and then this last part. Maybe I can get that done. Oh, by the way, I, I don't even know if I mentioned it. Maybe I did last class, but chapter 7 is one of those interludes that I was talking about where it shows death and then something before the throne of the Lamb and this rejoicing and all that. That's why we're going through this. Probably next class, we'll get into chapter 11. We're going to jump to chapter 11 because that's another inter interlude. So you can see the same thing is being replayed over and over. And that's why it has these things of down here and then up there and down here and up there. So you can see the, it's a, it's a clear-cut pattern in the scriptures. All right, so this last part is uh, verse 17. <clears throat> for, the uh, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of, of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I think I actually skipped part of this on purpose. <clears throat> make, make no mistake, there are plenty of tears that are shed because of the sorrows and sufferings that we that the followers of the Lamb endure for others and by others, but because of his nature. But at a certain point, the tears will cease. When is that moment? It happens only after you become Lamb's wife. <clears throat> in Revelation 7, 17, Lamb in the midst of the throne. Well, let me say this. Um, uh, if you'll notice, it says, um, in verse 13, who, who are, notice the tense, who are, not who will they be or 
who were they? Who are <clears throat> these who are arrayed? Um, thou knowest. Uh, verse 14, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. Okay, verse 15, uh, therefore are they before the throne and serve him, sitteth upon the throne. Verse 16, they shall. It changed tenses. It, it changed from what they're, he's seeing they are to what will come. Okay, so what are they? They're lambs. What will come? There will come a day when this is settled and he will wipe away all tears and he'll, they won't hunger anymore. And you see what I'm saying? That there's a tense change. And this, this wiping away tears is not what you get immediately upon quote unquote getting to heaven or whatever. You see, what, you see that? It's not. It can't be. <clears throat> okay. Um, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall, again, future tense, lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. <clears throat> so first of all, lamb in the midst of the throne equals the lamb at the center of the throne. If the lamb is at the center of the throne of our heart, then the glorious thing to us is not that of getting our tears wiped away, but of fellowship and with him in his sufferings. Amen? Okay, so why does much of Christianity always looking forward to getting their tears wiped away? Because they don't see, okay, they, don't, they don't see this in light of the lamb. They don't see Revelation in light of it's a book about us giving ourselves. You could throw that book away and just say read Romans 8 or many other places, 2 Corinthians 4, or, you know, on and on and on. I mean, 2 Corinthians 4 is even better than we think. Maybe you've seen it beyond me, but I'm telling you that I would love to go back and just start going, hey, look at this, you know, and look at this, because it's just... Mm, mm, mm. <clears throat> okay, so um, their tears shall be future, washed away, and lead them unto living fountains of water. <clears throat> In truth, it's not about them getting their tears wiped away or them getting living. Eventually, they will have the living waters flowing out of them, coming from the throne in them, coming from the slain lamb seated on it in them, New Jerusalem. So it's way better than this, you know? But he's only saying, it's going in the future, it's gonna be really good, and we're going, oh, you know, and if we're carnal, we'll go, oh, you know, and if we really want the Lord, we'll see the reality of it is much greater than just, you know, getting, getting some water. <laughs> it's greater than getting water. <clears throat> um, their tears shall be future washed away and lead them unto living water, fountains of living water. They have perceived the lamb slain in chapter five. Their focus is not that lamb is on the throne in chapter seven, but there is a forward progression that must happen whereby the, sl the lamb slain and enthroned will eventually be inside of them and they shall discover the rivers of living water not for them but through them to others it has to be doesn't it in light of the truth it, it, that's how it has to end <laughs> and the end of that is the wrapping up of everything that, that the father wanted and the son wanted and, and see, even at the end of it, it gets to the end of it, and it doesn't, and the Holy Spirit is still there, and he's like, he's like, well, since we're just talking about the end, hey, bride, join with me. Come to this. Come. Remember, I, I, I'm sure I can't find it right now. It was a NIV version, and your thing just said you had got low power mode. Um, the translation in the NIV of uh, 
of Revelation 1 where he says, uh, uh, the time has come uh, that it is now, that if, you know, that we should hear his words and put them to work in our hearts for the time is now. The time for this lamb is now. Is now. We don't have to wait someday for a future event. We can live with the Lord in this spirit regardless of what we're going through. So let's pray. Amen. Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name and we ask you to just seal us in our minds. Seal us right now at this stage of the book of Revelation. We would be content just to be sealed in this and, uh, and sealed with the seal of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. And oh, how that would carry us through all these other seals and all these other trumpets and all these other bowls, vials. So Holy Spirit, um, make it real. Make him preeminent in us, not just before us, on the throne. May that throne that the Lamb is on in chapter 5 and in chapter 7, and may that throne be transported like the ark was transported from before us to in us as we become new Jerusalem wife of the Lamb. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.